Good afternoon. Thank you for um, all coming back from your very brief break. I want to introduce our last speaker and before we um, have our discussion. Dr. Amy Bono is a visiting assistant professor in colonial Latin American art at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and an affiliated researcher at the Rio de Janeiro State University. Dr. Bono studies the visual and material culture of Latin America and the Atlantic world, with a particular focus on Brazil. Her interests include indigenous and Afro-Brazilian artistic practices, material and intangible heritage studies, and colonialism and ethnopolitics. Deeply interdisciplinary, her work intersects with science studies, art and anthropology, museum history and philosophy, and art historical historiography and methodology. She has received fellowships from Fulbright, Fulbright Hayes, Social Science Research Council, Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts, the Getty Institute, and the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science. Her forthcoming books include Tupinamba Feathercraft in the Brazilian Atlantic, and a second book co-edited with Zan Dupre, A Cultural History of Color in the Renaissance. Her current research project centers on the visuality and materiality of crime in the Civil Police Museum of Rio de Janeiro. Welcome, Amy. Uh, thank you everyone here, especially for your endurance um, for, for staying this long. It's always hard to go last. Um, but I wanted to thank especially Tomas and Kim and Aleka and Elena um, and Jennifer and Marissa for um, inviting me here and to be part of this wonderful conference. Okay. In his 1959 essay, Brazilian poet and art critic Ferreira Goulart introduced the term non-object, which lately has had considerable currency within contemporary Brazilian art circles. A member of the concrete and neo-concrete movements, Goulart pushed the framework of the art object beyond the traditional confines of painting and sculpture, advocating for a concept of the artwork that is phenomenologically open, privileging the viewer's encounter with things. While Goulart's interests were in shifting the visual arts and poetry beyond modernist frames, I am deploying his term non-object today to help us think about the status of objects within exhibition practices in museums of history, anthropology, and community in Brazil. According to Goulart, the non-object is, is, and this is quote, not an anti-object, but a special object through which a synthesis of sensorial and mental experiences is intended to take place. It is a transparent body in terms of phenomenological knowledge. While being entirely perceptible, it leaves no trace. It is pure appearance." End quote. In my talk today, I particularly want to deploy the notion of the non-object as a useful metaphor for thinking through paradigms of colonial Brazilian visual and material culture as it is collected, represented, and viewed in museum displays. The cultural traditions and artistic practices of indigenous Brazil at the time of European invasion encompassed cultures invested in orality, but without script, socially grouped into migratory coastal indigenous nations with highly structured communities, but without permanent architecture. For the Tupi nations of 16th and 17th century Brazil, artistic practices functioned and still function today within soundscapes, where the auditory, the gestural, and the corporeal dialogued with the material, where crafted objects embodied power and house spiritual entity, entities. In other words, much of Tupi culture was ephemeral or intangible, which has shaped the conditions under which museums now display indigenous Brazilian culture and history. For example, a 16th century Amerindian maraca rattle or the Ahove pod ankle bracelets worn by a Tupi dancer might contain supernatural voices. Rhythms, sounds, incantations, movements, and gestures resulted in the body itself becoming a transformative medium. While from an early modern European perspective, a maraca rattle might have been valued as a superbly crafted artifact, for its makers, it more importantly possessed vitality and an essence. Put in Goulart's terms, early modern Europeans understood the rattle and the ankle bracelets as objects, but the Tupi seem to have used them as non-objects, as corporally charged and immersed in soundscapes, as contributing factors within an experiential phenomenon. Indigenous material culture from the colonial period primarily survives in two contexts, 
First, there are those objects seized, brought, or bartered from living indigenous to be communities by 16th and 17th century European merchants, missionaries, and administrative officials. These consist of a small corpus of elaborately crafted, exquisitely colored featherwork, weaponry, such as enormous war clubs made of Brazil wood, arrows, and musical instruments made of bone. All of this resides in European collections outside of Brazil and almost entirely inaccessible to Brazilian museums. A second corpus of material is the archaeological record that has been compiled in post-colonial Brazil through the work of different national and international excavations, especially robust since the 1960s but begun as early as the early modern period and through the 19th century. Excavations at Tupi Guarani sites, which span the length of the entire eastern, eastern seaboard of Brazil, have yielded a substantial body of ceramics that are now primarily located in Brazilian museums of anthropology, such as the National Museum of Rio. In Rio, sorry. These elaborate polychrome ceramics are isolated, museologically speaking, from most other extant historical Tupi material. What impact does this have on Brazilian museums and their display techniques when dealing with indigenous histories from the colonial period, with ethnogenesis, and with discussions of indigeneity? Well, I will begin with the National Museum, which originated from the Royal Collections and is now linked to the Ministry of Education. As one of Brazil's oldest scientific institutions and one of the largest collections of natural history and anthropology in Latin America, it is also one of the city's most well-attended public museums, especially for school students. Here I'm showing you one of the rooms in the archaeology section of the museum, specifically one that is devoted to Tupi Guarani ceramics, of which I was just speaking. Though these images are of poor quality, and forgive me, this was a cell phone photo and the best I could do, they get the point across. One of the consistent modes of representation of the indigenous cultures of colonial Brazil is to show Tupi artifacts in correlation to the Northern European printed images of the Tupi made in the late 16th and 17th centuries. In this room, the hand-colored engravings by the Netherlandish printer Theodore de Brie are shown illustrating cannibal acts, which the installation links to the ceramic designs. And here I'm actually showing you um, here a kind of close-up of the design and a description of it, which they correlate directly to the print above. How is the viewer to understand this relationship? Is the print a prop for the ceramic, confirming the vessel was once part of a living culture? Or is the ceramic record a, a prop for the prints, materially confirming some truth value to the European printed image? In fact, the first 200 years of colonization of, in Brazil are often manifest via surrogates in museums of anthropology because of a con con concatenation of absences. Objects exiled across the Atlantic, European in images and text substituting for Tupi orality, museum artifacts standing in for long vanished performances and rituals. This, of course, has enormous impact on the construction of indigenous histories and of ideas of indigeneity in Brazil today. My paper this afternoon uses this idea of the non-object to explore how a set of exhibitions in Rio de Janeiro contend creatively with this aggravated dialectic between absences and presences. First, however, I want to briefly look at two 2016 exhibitions from the Netherlands, both of which signal this issue of presences and absences that so persistently frames the visual and material history of early colonial Brazil. This past year, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam mounted a small but very impressive exhibition of the 17th century Dutch landscape painter Frans Post, based around 34 newly attributed animal drawings found in the Harlem archives. Meanwhile, Leiden's Ethnology Museum opened a smaller exhibition devoted to feather arts from across the globe, titled World of Feathers, including several Tupi featherwork headdresses. These small headdresses on a rare loan from the National Museum of Denmark were positioned next to a 17th century painting by Adrian Hahnemann, the posthumous portrait of Mary Henrietta Stuart. And I'm actually showing you this here, and you'll see it in detail in a, one of the next slides. Unlike the Tupi Guarani ceramics and debris engravings that mutually enlivened one another in the National Museum of Brazil, these Tupi headpieces here serve to confirm the veracity of their artistic representation and the painting to authenticate the featherwork's currency in 17th century European courts. 
These two exhibitions brought Brazil's colonial history to light in the country that briefly controlled Brazil's northeastern region between 1630 and 1654 and conceived of that territory as Dutch Brazil. Though a relatively brief 24-year period, the artistic output of Dutch artists and scientists was one of the richest and most significant resources on new world colonization during the 17th century. In the context of Brazil's visual culture, this has added importance, not just as curious European colonial imagery of the period, but as some of the only pictorial representations of the first 130 years of European contact in Brazil. For Brazilian historians, art historians, and anthropologists, this, these landscape images and nature images, more importantly, become a proto-ethnographic treasure trove. The post-exhibition was conceived of as a joint venture with a Naturalis Biodiversity Center in Leiden, with dozens of stuffed animals positioned near the post-landscape paintings. Here I'm showing you the animal star of the show, a large stuffed jaguar, which was placed near the post-drawing and in front of a map of 17th century Pernambuco by Georg Markgraf, which also includes uh, the same animal in the upper left-hand corner of the image. But what exactly was this taxidermy supposed to do for viewers? And how did it function for museum goers and for the way Brazil was framed? Beyond conceiving of this installation as an essentialation of Brazil as nature, we should remember that the point was to show the newly discovered post drawings and animals. By including taxidermied animals, Post was framed as the faithful eyewitness recorder of 17th century Brazil. The quote, real animals, served as indices for a historical space that could not be shown, but which was represented on the walls in these maps, drawings, and landscape paintings. At the same time, these early modern images ceased to be art historical works and instead became illustrations of the veracity of Brazilian flora and fauna. The taxidermy made Post drawings real. Post images confirmed the truth of a historical Brazil. It was revealing to watch people move back and forth between the animals and the images, walking around the room, discussing just how well the stuffed animals and images corresponded. What was the prop and what was the object? Which, for the viewers, had primacy? The nearby Leiden ethnographic exhibition, World of Feathers, was an entirely different affair. A show constructed around the idea of feathers as an artistic and cultural medium across cultures, and even as media for fashion today, the curator produced different thematic environments. One of the strangest spaces installed, <laughs> and you have to actually forgive these because these are the glossy museum photos, and when you actually went through these spaces, they were, they were extraordinarily dark. One of the strangest spaces installed feather working from around the globe, placed in vitrines outside of a giant cage, around which viewers walked while immersed in recorded jungle sounds. Just outside, in a nearby space, a crimson wall was installed as a peep show room. No doubt a reference to the red light districts. Through the peepholes, viewers saw vintage clips of women dancing, dancing in feathered outfits. While well, all of this adds up to an extraordinarily theatrical museography, the interesting part for me was also the installation of the Tupi works. Two feather pieces flank the portrait of Mary Henrietta Stewart. Again, the conundrum, what is object and what is prop? Does the painting confirm the presence of Tupi feather work in early modern Europe, or does the feather work validate the fidelity of Hanuman's painting? A recent exhibition in Rio at the Museum of the Indian, the museum devoted to Brazil's indigenous populations, is an example of the possibilities one can use to exhibit Amerindian materiality and memory in a museum space that brings to mind the non-object metaphor with which we began. In 2015, Rio-based anthropologist and art historian Els Legro, who's also a former GRI scholar, mounted a major exhibition entitled On the Way of Beads, Art and Alterity Among Amerindians for the Museum of the Indian in Rio. The museum was founded in 1953 by Darcy Ribeiro, one of Brazil's most important anthropologists and activists for indigenous peoples, and it forms part of the National Foundation of the Indian, or FUNAI, the cultural and scientific agency of the Brazilian government that establishes and carries out policies relating to indigenous peoples. 
The museum thus serves only secondarily as an exhibition space. Its primary mission is as a national center to promote indigenous causes and indigenous legislation and to act as a reposi repository for tangible and indigenous intangible heritage, memory and language, among other things. On the Way of the Beads, the exhibition highlighted beadwork, misangas, as an integral part of the construction of the Amerindian body in many Brazilian indigenous communities. The intricate beadwork called misangas, a Portuguese word of Bantu origin, are recorded from the 16th century in Brazil and survive on one tupi object that's now at the Quai in Paris, and are described in piecemeal accounts in the ethno-historical record and in the ex exhibition, and here I'm showing you an installation shot on the screen, there were 700 works from 34 ethnic groups across contemporary Brazil, as well as 20 films, in order to show the vitality of this as an indigenous art form today. The main thesis of Els Legros' exhibition was that beads and bead, beadwork capture in miniature what she calls life forces, or almost bodies, which she describes as the materiality of exogenous forces from groups outside and that how they are then incorporated into ritual aesthetics of the body. Her exhibition showed how what she terms, and this is in her, her, in her exhibition um, catalog, an Amerindian discourse conceives of body themselves as artifactually produced. This complicated relationship between body and artifact again relates to the metaphor of the non-object with which I began. The installation playfully employed a twist on the notion of Legros' almost bodies. Faceless mannequins were decked with elaborate misanga armbands, necklaces, and bandoliers. Thus, beads as almost bodies were placed on incomplete mannequins in order to help viewers understand the relationship between artifact and body, which was then further enlivened with sound installations of songs and videos shot in indigenous communities across Brazil. Thus, indigenous voices and stories featured prominently in understanding misanga as assemblages, their materiality and their significance to larger myth histories, to songs, as well as to commercial markets of artisanal crafts today. The disjunction we saw in the Dutch exhibitions has altered here. In at least one sense, with the misangas acting as almost bodies, objects and indices are bound into one. Well, this immediately brings to the fore deep debates concerning how the ontological turn in Brazilian anthropology and the underlying disputes between animism and perspectivism as philosophical models has affected descriptions of Amerindian communities in Brazil. What is more relevant for today's discussion is how this museum display technique affects the viewer's understandings of misangas. In other words, what kind of museum outcome is produced by the simple maneuver of putting these beads on pseudo bodies and juxtaposing them with video clips that do assert an indexical claim to living cultures, especially within the context of this particular institution? In this noteworthy photograph, we see one indigenous leader, the famous Cacique Rayone Cayapo, walking through the exhibition, a reminder that the museum of the Indian's mission is tied to indigenism and indigeneity, and that the active participation of those communities on a national stage. As the photo suggests, not only was the exhibition mounted for an indigenous audience, but it also served as a framing device for indigenous actors. In addition, the show worked to complicate the misanga, taking it out of a solely indigenous framework and revealing its connections to Afro-Brazilian material culture and religious practice. Up until this point, I've been looking at museum displays of early colonial and contemporary indigenous cultures of Brazil, but similar issues of absence and presence, intangibility and embodiment can be found in museums and exhibitions displaying Afro-Brazilian art and culture, albeit for radically different reasons. While much early colonial indigenous material survives in exile across the Atlantic, Afro-Brazilian religiosity and its material culture has been entangled in a web of juridical relationships with Brazilian colonial administrative systems and the modern nation state that both sought to suppress it. Between 1530 and 1822, between 3.5 and 5 million Africans were brought to Brazil as slaves, accounting for 38% of the population. In many areas, persons of African birth or descent were the demographic majority. Historically speaking, Afro-Brazilian religiosity has been consistently surveilled and frequently, though not actively, suppressed. 
The artworks, material objects, ephemeralia, and temples associated with Candomblé and Umbanda practices were considered criminal evidence. The seizure of African and then Brazilian-derived religious objects goes as far back as the early modern Portuguese Inquisition. Juridical systems and criminal codes changed during the long colonial period, as did levels of tolerance of what constituted quote unquote sorcery. The sociability of Afro-Brazilian religious and cultural expression, whether condomble rituals or caipoeira movements, were perceived as potentially dangerous forms of congregation and communication, and were viewed as forms of resistance. It is in this context that the associated material culture could be seized as criminal evidence. Brazilian museums contending with Afro-Brazilian heritage in a historic frame must deal with object absences caused not by being in distant collections or being discarded as ephemera, but by their placement in contemporary spaces of legal and political limbo. Today, many of these objects live in current or former police collections, seized as part of political suppression campaigns at various moments in Brazil's history. Their real and perceived efficacious powers further make these objects extraordinarily fraught to display. In many instances, the Afro-Brazilian objects that were seized, were seized, um, such objects included, excuse me, sacred stones, the living manifestations of shrines and their fundamentos or foundations in both physical and metaphysical senses. Other objects seized included those used as instruments and rituals, accoutrements or implements of the orishas, or deities, as well as the wrappings, offerings, and scented materials that enlivened multi-sensory condomble rituals. Here, for example, on the left, is a collection of seized Afro-Brazilian objects taken by the court police in Rio during the late 19th century. These exquisitely crafted iron implements were associated with particular orishas, for example, miniature bows and arrows, staffs, spears, armlets, swords, and knives, all featured as part of the visual and material pantheon used in ceremonies. One can see how the, arrow, the arrows associated with the deity Oshosi and fans associated with that of Oshum. The National Museum where these are now exhibited, the same museum I discussed in relation to Tupi Guarani ceramics, in fact explicitly acknowledges their problematic provenance, highlighting its own ties to imperial collections in the process. And on the right is an object stored in the Civil Police Museum today, where it has never been exhibited. It is in both a practical and metaphorical sense an incarcerated object. The histories of these objects make them difficult to exhibit within the contours of the institutions in which they sit. In the example of the Civil Police Museum in Rio, some of these objects are packed in brown boxes in a storage site, others sit in the city morgue. In Salvador Bahia, Afro-Brazilian objects from the 19th and early 20th centuries are found in the city museum, others in the basements of the Museum of Legal Medicine, an uncertain space chosen because Condomble foundation stones must never be seen because they're too powerful. While not unique to Brazil, similar campaigns of suppression have occurred across Latin America and especially in Cuba. It merits thinking about how material memory and its absence and presence sits in the modern Brazilian museum apparatus. Rio's National Museum of History, different museum than the other Museo Nacional, has countered this history of Afro-Brazilian suppression and omission with creative installations that in lieu of the materially inaccessible past signal the vitality of the present. In their permanent installations, after a very visceral, visceral documentation of slavery in the rooms preceding it, there was a space dedicated to African heritage and Brazilian culture Viewers find the opulent jewelry made of gold and silver that women of African descent fastened around their waists, especially in Minas in the 18th and 19th centuries, as amulets with the power to ward off evil. There are identity cards revealing the language and bureaucratic structures of racial classification. The centerpiece of the room is an installation of a contemporary condomble altar to the Orisha Oshala by Emmanuel Arajo. The altar directly references the condomble altars that sit in the tajeros or religious communities across Rio and across Brazil. Araujo's piece was commissioned for a 2011 exhibition, which became a permanent installation, entitled The Portuguese in the World, 1415 to 1822, at the National History Museum, an exhibition that detailed the global expansion of the Portuguese maritime empire and included indigenous, Portuguese, Dutch, French, and African works. 
Araujo's altarpiece was one of the few contemporary works commissioned for the show, specifically to highlight the presence of Africans and their descendants. The choice of, of him as an artist, of course, was a calculated endeavor. Not only an important Afro-Brazilian artist today, he's also the founding director and curator of the Afro Museum, Brazil's only public institution devoted solely to African and Afro-Brazilian art. With over 6,000 works in their collection, the Museo Afro in Sao Paulo has become a hugely important institution in the country, a site of not only culture and identity, but also a research center and outreach, outreach program for, for kids in Sao Paulo. Araujo's Oshala Altar brings the space of the Condomble Temple into a dialogue with African heritage and cultural expression in the Brazilian context. Oshala's embodiment is almost always rendered in a splendor of whiteness. While Araujo's installation is an altar representing the fundamento or foundation, in this case by the vessels holding the foundations of a religious community. The silver flowers placed in vases in front of the elevated pedestal reference the ubiquitous flowers in these religious spaces. How does the viewer encounter this installation? How might we understand Araujo's installation as a dialogue with notions of presence and absence, or to put it back in Goulart's terms on the non-object, quote, it is not an anti-object, but a special object through which a synthesis of sensorial and mental experiences is intended to take place. It is a transparent body in terms of phenomenological knowledge. While being entirely perceptible, it leaves no trace. It is pure appearance." End quote. And pure appearance is exactly what this installation is about. It represents what cannot be shown. The sacred foundations of altars here props for the real thing in religious communities. The giant white beaded crown hovers over the entire altar, referencing the incarnation of ancestral forces. The misangas raining down over the luxurious fabrics in the center, here disembodied, represent the orisha, the immaterial energies that become part of the bodies of the receiver. The artist thus shows viewers the transitory nature of these energies. The point is that objectness of this piece is not as important as the conceptual matrix that underlies these as props, to use that term cautiously here. Curiously, critics of this installation have called this a carnivalesque rendition of a condomble altar. And those critics have a point. They're looking for the realness in such a piece, the connection to sensorial dimensions, the flashes of color, the overwhelming smells, the trance-inducing rhythms of drums, of songs, of the ground shrewn with flowers and herbs. In this very limited sense, since it, since it is actually an altar and a work of contemporary art, we might consider the Araujo altar like taxidermied animals or the early modern debris prints or the misanga-laden mannequins as a kind of prop, standing in for the real, corporeally centered, unbounded realm of experience beyond the confines of the museum. By introducing Goulart's metaphor of the non-object within the context of a discussion of museums, I wish to suggest the complicated ways that Brazilian material culture sits in museum spaces. This is not to claim that equivalent issues of absence and presence or of distinguishing text and context, object and prop, do not occur in other exhibitions and other places, but they are peculiarly present and persistent in exhibitions about Brazil and museums in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you, um, Amy and Megan and Viola for your talks this afternoon. Um, just kind of a continuation of a lot of the really interesting questions and uh, issues that were brought up this morning and I, I'm, my head is swimming a little trying to make a lot of connections because they're, they're as I'm kind of jotting things down, but um, I wanted to just uh, really turn it over to all of you to ask questions. I have a couple of comments or questions to kind of get started though. Um, one of the things that I, you know, really came up in, in your talk, especially with the recording at the end, and then of course, Amy, with your discussion of the auditory dimension as well as the, you know, olfactory and all of these mm -hmm. other ex examples, um, is how much we've, how much we, there's uh, this, you know, t at the risk of stating the obvious, this, the primacy of the visual, right? That these, these histories that we've been talking about have to do with visual objects, as well as you know, buildings, whether they're old or new, and in fact, it's one of those. Um, I think you know one of the major differences in terms of 
pre-Columbian or pre-Cabralian histories, right? That in Mesoamerica, they found buildings and they're you know, these kind of you know, majestic pyramids. Um, and in Brazil, they found feathers, they, you know, things that kind of disintegrate. So you don't, you don't have that same kind of ability. It's, there's, it's much more intangible. Um, and I just, with both of, your, both of your talks, it just forced me to kind of think about this, or I wanna you know, put it back to you, the challenges of how you document this and how you exhibit these things, um, the auditory practice or the, I mean, is there ever a way to do it correctly or, and I don't think that, I don't think correct is even possible, but what is the, what is a, what would you say would be, what would you like to see, perhaps? Um, I personally think this is a question of the contemporary, of the time. Mm -hmm. Today we are so much image fixed mm -hmm. and we're leaving the text-based tradition and um, we are not anymore separating tone from images, but we have videos yeah. and, and, and performance. And, and today with the technique, technical pop, uh, possibilities we have, um, you have to have a certain message if you only want to have people hear a sound tape mm -hmm. for certain reasons. Or the same thing as you say, we are, we are flooded by images. We are mm -hmm. so much flooded by images that I would say, Hey, stop. Um, I mean, I always miss the smelling in exhibitions mm -hmm. anyway. So um, I think we have to turn to invent and create special exhibitions focusing, focusing on these different kind of media we have available. Mm -hmm. So maybe at the end we really um, have these, we also have a huge collection of films. Mm -hmm. With tone, without tone, cut, uncut. And, um, we have other possibilities than just exhibitions. I learn this every year in, in, in Berlin, we have this Berlinale Festival. Mm -hmm. And I spent there almost two weeks and I see like four films per day mm -hmm. because it gives me so much critical views on myself that you don't have to put everything in an exhibition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have to make a decision, what is your topic? Why are you creating exhibition? What is in this exhibition? And what are you doing in this accompanying programs maybe? Mm -hmm. Or what do you leave over to the film media? But does it all, but I guess, does this, the, the auditory office have to be relegated to the, you know, the illustration or the prop? I mean, you mm -hmm. talked, Amy, quite a bit about this kind of, which is the object, which is the prop? And I guess I'm curious about that with the, you know, the soundscapes. And of course, it's not. This isn't just an issue yeah. in Brazil. I mean, this is the same as you know religious art from early modern European churches and and whatnot. This right. is not unique, but it's it seems particularly important at this. Well, I think there's a whole sensory turn in art history and anthropology in general and in museum exhibition practices, which is one thing. But I think if we get back to sort of the case of Brazil and the differences between Mesoamerica or other or other places, I think there's a reliance on the now. Mm -hmm. and contemporane contemporaneous um, indigenous communities in a way that there, there, there isn't in documentations and mm -hmm. histories and museum practices of other places in the Americas. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about this Misanga show actually was that the last room, I don't know if anybody in this room saw it, but in the last room they actually had holograms and colored um, images of Tupi objects hmm. in the back room, connecting it yeah. to a show about contemporary Amazonian communities mm -hmm. and communities now. So there was an attempt to create a kind of historical, historical line, lineage, especially because so many indigenous groups today across Brazil see that as part of their yeah. heritage, right? So but just the hologram is interesting too, right? Something that's right. virtual. Yeah. I, also, I also wanted to ask about um, repatriation laws and the kind of history of that. Particularly this kind of came to mind when you were speaking, Megan, about these quasi-clandestine that, you know, you were talking about these, these people involved in this network that probably knew they were doing something illegal or half of what they were doing was illegal, but I'm curious of when, either when repatriation laws or, and those types of import-export laws became, you know, landed on the books, and then when did they actually become enforced mm -hmm. or 
more enforced, let's say? <laughs> well, that's a very complicated question. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, if I could just add something to the other discussion. Mm -hmm. um, just, I think it is a really important point of how do we bring all the senses into the museum. One of my favorite installations was something that Diana Magaloni worked on at the National Museum in Mexico a few years ago in which they'd recorded whistles, ancient Mexican whistles, and then had a way for you to blow into it where you basically just like setting off a sensor and then you heard it. So it both involved the body and the physical aspect of the body as well as the, uh -huh. the sound as well, which I thought was really wonderful. And I know in my own work as a curator, trying to find other ways to whether showing x-rays that have rattles in them or speaking about tactility to sort of, because I think this is a, a very big problem yeah. of museums is that it is about the visual and we lose so much of the point of making and use of these objects. Yeah, you can't touch them, you can't come near them, you can't mm -hmm. smell them, mm -hmm. you have this physical barrier. And so how can we, working within the confines of museums, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. figure that out? And I think you know, artist interventions are also really important and indigenous artists' mm -hmm. interventions, obviously really important as well. Definitely. Okay, so your question about laws. I mean, Mexico had laws about exporting from the 19th century. Okay. And so, um, but you don't get United States import laws essentially until at least 1972 when there was an agreement. Okay. Well, you get Mexico with this sort of like, this is all property of the nation, or pr mm -hmm. property is probably not the right word, and there are people in this room who would, could much better explain this history than I can. Um, so, you know, and what's interesting is that you do see a, f um, the ch a change in the business of the mm -hmm. Stendhal Galleries after this time, at least from what I've been able to see so okay. far. So you see this sort of diving down in what's happening, though at the same time, it coming out of Mexico certainly was a problem. Now, yeah. What you're calling repatriation laws, you might be thinking of NAGPRA for the Native American Grave and Repatriation Act, which only applies to United States oh, okay. Native materials. Okay. And there was actually a really interesting session that uh, Viola and I sat in at the Society for American Archaeology about mm -hmm. NAGPRA, and then, you know, some of this is what happens with objects from Mexico. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, or maybe you ask that, and there isn't. And so, so it's a really important question, and mm -hmm. I think something that, how do we deal with this information? Or, mm -hmm. you know, we do have some new information from these archives that, how are we gonna deal with this? And I think what's really important, and both Matthew, who may be on a plane or on the way to the <laughs> airport now, and I have, feel very strongly, and in my conversations with Diana in our department, is transparency is extremely important. Yeah. And whatever we need to do as museum curators to have good relationships with our, um, colleagues in other countries we want to do because that's right. our responsibility to the objects, to the people mm -hmm. um, who made them and who touched them over the years to uncover these trajectories of the objects as well as be responsible mm -hmm. about them. So it's a, it's a many, many cans of worms. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> so, I'm sure. It's just, it was, yeah, it was and it's important to talk about it, absolutely. Coming back up, because obviously throughout the various colonial enterprises, things moved around quite yeah. easily. And I just, you know, out of curiosity, wondering how, what the ebb and flow of was that, how that took place over the 19th century, which was obviously a very active time, but then kind of going into the 20th century, as many of these collections were really established. But I think we are really stepping into a new area about this. So you have NACPRA. It does not fit for Europeans, but we look at you. Right. And we already have the, the first cases that we try, even though we have to, to adapt um, NACPRA rules to European collection when it's about human remains, of course, and ritual mm -hmm. objects that have still a valuable uh, value in the community today. So I think in, a, let's say, 10 years ahead from this, we will have a totally changed situation hmm. in all museums. There is mm -hmm. something on the move. Yeah. And what's also really interesting is this you know, concepts of property and legality. Yeah. Because if you get like, the, all the protests at auctions in Paris, let's say, um, it comes down to property laws, not yeah. like who should own this object, who made it, but it's all about property laws. And so it's really interesting is, will we be able to get around that? 
and how, how would mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. happen? And that's how, you know, in a way, we'll be able to keep all, yeah. keep objects in museums <laughs> or, you know, or d does there need to be more fluidity mm -hmm. in exchanging of objects in much more transparent ways? Yeah, so. I mean, it's interesting because as we know, you know, many things don't, I mean, the, I think the headdress is a great, has been, you know, come up several times today as something that, <laughs> yeah for unknown reasons, doesn't travel. I mean, there are a lot of versions of why it, why it can't return or why, you know, and so I think those, exactly, those transparency would actually be great with, the res yeah. with respect to the headdress, because it seems like that there's anything but that. Everybody's got different, different versions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to open it up. Yeah, Rafael. Yeah, um, I was I was very struck seeing the three the three papers together by the the ways in which these constellations of objects across uh, different museums, different collections, different exhibitions, different countries. You know, we, we have all these transfers and exchanges and uh, transcultural situations coming up. And this is of course, it's, and I was struck by the fact uh, in all three papers that these new narratives, these uh, transcultural narratives have the power uh, potentially to completely uh, uproot and destroy uh, all of the, the old national narratives. Uh, and this, and of course, as an art historian, especially, I mean, you know my point of view from this morning, uh, this, this is very attractive. Um, it's very seductive. It seems to be what we should be doing more of. On the other hand, uh, there's this seem, there seems to be a strange, eerie parallel with the global art market and the way that um, commodities, art as commodity, is getting spread around the globe. So I was wondering if uh, the three of you could somehow enlighten me on um, the strange feeling that I'm getting in the pit of my stomach that, we're, that <laughs> maybe this is not the best way forward. Who has the answer? Who has the solution? <laughs> was, you sure it wasn't something you ate? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I feel qualified to answer. I don't know if I understand what your question is. I mean, the discomfort I absolutely feel. Um, but then, moving forward, I don't know. What do you yeah, I'm not sure I understand exactly what you mean, either. I mean. Could you explain it further a little bit about what, okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, I'm really the, uh, looking at the way that you work, you, uh, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, the Brazilian objects or the Mexican mm -hmm. objects come up in different national contexts, mm -hmm. and they, the way they have been contextualized within national narratives. And then suddenly when you start crossing borders and comparing these narratives, it breaks down the old narrative and you have to come up with new ones. And this is very exciting. I mean, this, this seems to be um, a, a way that we can we completely rewrite the old histories. Uh, and now, uh, what I'm wondering about is, the, is how this relates to uh, the way that objects and artifacts move in a global art market, uh, where the a sort of borderless, stateless uh, art fair, um, uh, uh, these uh, stateless art deposits that we have in, uh, off, off, off out of Swiss borders, for instance, you know, these uh, warehouses. So well, it seems that the objects are uh, somehow being uprooted, in, uh, uh, uprooted from their traditional national histories and becoming part of a global art history. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, so I'm just wondering uh, if, uh, it's not really, I don't really have an answer. I'm asking a real question. Mm -hmm. um, the, okay. It seems to me that there, there is a, a relationship that has to be teased out between the, the uh, end of these national histories or these nationalist histories and globalization and the new nationalism and things that are coming up uh, challenge, challenging us right now. Is, does that make it any clearer? Yeah, well, I, I, I may have just a little bit to say. I mean, what's interesting in thinking about sort of following these parallel histories of museum exhibitions that Mexico is doing, the Mexican government or nation is doing versus what the dealer collectors are doing, that they, they literally are following each other from city to city, which is so fascinating, and using some of the same language. Like, the dealer catalogs will quote Caso, right? And so it's this, 
or similar language and um, in a way also sort of appropriating this nationalism by talking about all of the Americas, right? By talking about the American artist, not the US artist, not the Mexican artist, but thinking about the Americas as a whole is also a way for people in the US as early as the, you know, John Lloyd Stevens in the 19th century when he was traveling in the Yucatan um, and in Honduras of sort of appropriating this as all of our history, right? Which is problematic and that keeps happening over and over again. So you get that on the one hand, this appropriation that in some ways feels like, is it copying, is it imitating, but is it also influencing what's going on in Mexico? I don't know yet. Um, but then at the same time, you get this other line in which we think like, well, you might say national patrimony, but what about patrimony de la humanidad, of all humanity? That all of these objects belong to all humans mm -hmm. and should be circulating, which I know people, I, you're making a face, people will make these arguments and why you say, well, we need encyclopedic museums because we need to learn. And what's really interesting in reading about the development of the National Museum of Cultures of the World for Mexico is that, well, we need to participate in the whole globe as well, right? And so, it, though the National Museum of Anthropology becomes much more powerful and much more known, though the National Museum of Cultures is still there and still bringing in exhibitions from all over the world. So it's, it's really interesting as each, the different groups of people want to be more global, but do you do it at the expense of another culture's history? And that's also the question. Yeah. I don't know if that answers at all. <laughs> but the Swiss thing, the problem with the Swiss thing is that where's the transparency there? If you're talking about you know, these yeah, exactly. art, you know, places that are holding art until they get really expensive, that's the lack of transparency that, that we were mentioning. Well, I actually have something to add to that, and at least in the Brazilian context, um, the Museu do Inju has been doing a lot of work with the Quai Lee in Paris, and the indigenous art collectives that Funai was once sponsoring now are featured in the Quai Lee store and in different moda exhibitions in Paris and things like that. And that has been coming an increased way for different indigenous communities, of course, to have money, of course, you know, for um, political efforts and things like that. So in a way, these works are being thrown into a kind of international circuit of commerce that's connected to both FUNAI institutions in, in Europe and so on and so forth. So I think it is a complicated relationship in many ways and interesting how it's influencing and changing artistic practices today. And there's actually some, a wonderful um, Brazilian student at, at Udicampi writing a dissertation on this. So, yeah. More questions? Yeah, we have a question here. Thank you. I have a, a very, uh, very simple question for Megan. <laughs> but you showed a picture of Stendhal, and, and it looked like he was in a workshop, and, mm -hmm. and he had a work overalls on, and it, I mean, it looks like he was working on the pieces. And, and so. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was really putting them together, I suppose, because they're all fragmented. And, uh, yes. And so if that was occurring. Um, was he doing this ethically? I mean, would he wouldn't stick two pieces together from different parts, or do you know about that? I mean, that, that just seems fascinating to me that he was do doing that process, involved in it. Well, yeah. So actually, um, that photo shoot was done for Saturday Evening Post, and. Um, well, I wish Matthew were here. He would know the date exactly. I think it was in the 60s. Um, and his wife was so upset that he wouldn't change to a suit that he was wearing his overalls. But yes, that was his basement restoration table where he'd put things back together again because collectors want things that are whole. And yes, undoubtedly, there are pieces from different objects that are put together in holes. Mm -hmm. um, so, Yes, yes, and yes to your question. <laughs> and that's also where, you know, in now in museums where we can look back and know that about these possibilities, which I think people have known about for a long time. You can x ray them and see do you see differences, or you can just look at them and say, mm, that head doesn't belong to that. Um, but there's another thing, you know, we could only just sort of scratch the surface in this paper about, about what's in the Stendhal papers. But there's also, though this is also already public, that 
There were questions of fakes as well. So Achane sold Stendhal these materials. He sent them, I think, to New York. And all these questions about those are fake. I need my money back. Um, and then there's these wonderful lines, don't let the museum people tell you what's good or not. You need to tell them. <laughs> so um, yes, and I think what's really amazing about these papers that will be, you know, fodder for dissertations and who knows what, you know, study that the Getty in the future is that we will we'll be able to have very specific information about objects where we know where they went and we can trace their histories, absolutely. Yeah. Do you have a, Tomas. I, um, I'm still thinking about Amy's talk and want to thank you very much. Um, this was very inspiring. Um, we are more interested in the history of display of objects um, um, since a couple of years um, in museums and in exhibitions. And um, what is really, in my view, very really essential is um, that it mostly goes about the question of narrative. So um, what you try to give in an exhibition or in a display is something like a narrative, whatever this narrative is. So my question is um, comparing these um, examples you have given from the Netherlands mm -hmm. and um, in Amsterdam and in Leiden compared to the narratives in Brazil, I have the feeling, but I would like to learn more from you, um, that these European exhibitions were still more or less about exoticism. And, um, and so, um, where the um, narrative of the Brazilian exhibitions were more that um, people tried to identify with, with um, with what their past was. Mm -hmm. So is there still a kind of difference between a European perspective and, uh, and, the, um, and, the, and the problem of, um, or the question um, uh, in the um, Latin American world to find a way to identify with the objects they have. So that's my question. Yes, um, absolutely. I think the Leiden one is, is more obviously an attempt at a, at a kind of exoticizing environment to bring in a kind of large public. Um, that one's an easier one to deal with in a certain way. Um, the post-exhibition was, was very, very strange, um, mostly because it sat in a collection where the rest of the the 17th century Dutch landscapes, of course, were treated art historically. So what was so strange about those rooms is that the objects ceased to be works of art history. Yeah. And I, it was, I, you know, I attended it with a series of um, scholars of the period from different Dutch universities, and a, again, the interest was in veracity. It wasn't, this, this is exactly the kind of animal that we have in this collection. We can see that, that Post was documenting the flora and fauna of Pernambuco, et cetera, et cetera. There was no attempt to really discuss how he was playing with modes of landscape painting, how you could compare it to another landscape painting, a floor above in the museum, or juxtaposing it in any way. So um, that was revealing, first of all. I do think Brazilian museums, of course, have different investments. Their intellectual investments are different and the material they have to play with is different. Um, and yes, I, I mean, I think there's, there's more of an interest in placing things in sites and in chronologies, um, placing them in time and space, and talking about the functionality of objects in a, in a different, different sort of way. But in a way, it's unfair to compare perhaps the ceramics with the post because one is an archeology span exhibition and one is an in, a, in the Rijksmuseum, but yes, I think those points are, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. I know Viola yeah. has a question. I think there's always mm -hmm. a curator, and her, her curator has this big task of trying to explain the visitor about his goal. 
this issue. So there was just a critique in, in the German newspaper, Frankfurter Allgemeine, that mm -hmm. curators finally have to stop to be pedagogists. And, and peda pedagogi pedagogen, pedagogen. And I think this is just the wrong question because we want to show objects to the visitors and bring to them new information that otherwise they would not have. So I found your paper extremely ex mm -hmm. interesting because there seems to be rolling up in Europe now an old new fashion about bringing in natural science objects mm -hmm into culture, anthropological and art historical question and exhibitions that we would not have been thought about like five years ago. I didn't want to talk about Humboldt from mm -hmm. this time. <laughs> but we, we are right now, we are right now having this. You must include natural signs, objects. You must include not only the feathers, but also the birds, mm -hmm. not only the, the pictures, let, let's say an abstract um, image of a jaguar. You know, you yeah. must have the <laughs> stuff <laughs> jaguar in it. In and, and this is now interrupting our approach as cultural anthropologists yeah. to explain different kind of unique thinking of a world that does not separate sold objects and dead objects. Mm -hmm. Nature is one thing. And you explained that perfectly now with the um, uh, perspectivism mm -hmm. in, 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 in the Brazilian exhibition. So I think we're getting into a harder and harder time as anthropologists uh, to explain um, what we thought is, is our message. And, and the Leiden exhibition is just, is just for me, it's a roll back, sorry, but Did maybe, uh, no, uh, but uh, maybe uh, for them it's a roll forward, for me it's a roll backward, sorry. And it was a young curator too. Yeah, it was, yeah. 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 I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. Um, returning to the repartition thing, mm -hmm. from our perspective, we are kind of in a dead end. Every time there is an auction in Paris or in any other place, um, we, ha we have a lot of questions from the media asking us what, we, what can we do as a nation to recover those objects that are being sell, sell by the internet or, or an auction. And uh, it, it seems now that there's no possibility uh, because of this thing that you mentioned of the property law. But I was wondering in Europe and in the States if there's any kind of move, movement in the academia or at the museum uh, space to change that thing, to change this idea of uh, decontextualized objects as commodities and subject to property laws, to see them as uh, objects that were obtained uh, legally or illegally, but that belongs to other countries. Is there any new alternative to that, or, or are we just in that uh, dead end? No, that's another very good question. I mean, I th what's been interesting over the last number of years is that how much attention the auctions have been getting. That, and what has resulted is the auctions, the public auctions for pre-Columbian art, pre-Hispanic art, or the ancient Americas, whatever you want to call it, the public auctions are now going away because those are the ones where there's attention and it's going back to more private sales so this sort of clandestine market. So in a way what we had said before, like you shouldn't be selling these in auctions, now it's like, wait a minute, that was at least useful so we could follow where things were going. Yeah. Yeah. But because there's so much attention and you know, when there's an auction of, of ancient Mexican art, ancient Peruvian art, people, they, they are, there are complaints as well. There's, I think there should be. So it's really interesting how that's gonna go underground again, or, I mean, what we're also seeing is that the trade is, at least from, as far as I can see, is decreasing, that there are fewer people who are interested in collecting, um, and, you know, museums are buying less because of the problems, so it's, um, but, Yes, we're trying to talk about it more, absolutely, and talk about it with our colleagues in Costa Rica, Colombia, Mexico, Guatemala, because it's really important for us to have 
a conversation about the histories of these objects and how we can work together to understand them and share knowledge and um, that's what, you know, where we see sort of where is this very active movement of objects, some clandestine, but also very much as part of diplomacy, all these exchanges and loans of objects, Mexico sending their collections all over Europe and to Moscow um, and to LA and sort of us working in that um, where we're still exchanging objects, um, sharing in the design of exhibitions and then exchanging them. So, um, and work together in sort of dealing with, with these histories. I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think it's, it's something that we're, we're really encouraging us all to sort of think about, as opposed to saying like, sorry, the law protects us, yeah. which it does, but we want to have more of a dialogue as well. Great, thank you. Um, I think it's time for us to end, but I want to thank all of our speakers today and ask, and, or just remind you all that we'll be starting again tomorrow at 10 a.m. and hope to see you all there. Thank you.